low income families can and do often end up having more multi generational wealth than high income families. If you're talking about multi generational wealth and legacy with your mouth, but you only do things with your money that you'll get to enjoy and experience in your lifetime, then you're a fake. Run your home and your dough like a biblical boss. Mark, it's Passover in my home tonight. Well, it's Passover really around the world right now, but we're celebrating, we're having the Seder tonight in my house. As are we. We, the lamb is going on the smoker as soon as this uh, episode is over. And uh, it's raining, which is a bummer because I don't love smokering in the rain, but that's how the cookie crumbles. T- t- talk to me about that smoking in the rain. What's what's about smoking in the rain? It sounds I like just, a jazz tune. It's not. Uh, it's not as fun to stand next to the smoker and smell the the fumes of the burning whatever cherry wood uh, with an umbrella when it's raining. It's more like run out, do whatever you need to do, run back. Yeah. Okay. That's all. One little announcement before we dive in. Uh, this isn't new information, but maybe if you're one of those people that dips in when you see a topic that you're interested in, uh, Abraham's Wallet is having a retreat. And that is going to be, you can think of it as how, whatever you want. Uh, we're calling it the Abraham's Wallet Five Capitals Work It Weekend, meaning we're going to be talking about five capitals. We'll get into your world because we're going to, because Mark and I will both be there. And we want to help you work on your stuff, whatever your pain points are in your world. We are uh, limiting the number of people that we're uh, letting sign up. Uh, it's the weekend of October 11 through 13. Uh, you can fly into uh, Cincinnati, Lexington, or Louisville. Those are all kind of getting distance to where we'll be. We'll be in uh, the Kentucky area. And if you want to just put that aside on your calendar, If you want to go to the show notes, there is a survey on the show notes where you can just raise your hand and say, hey, I'm not committing to anything, but I would like it if you'd save me a place for the weekend. As I said, we're trying to limit the number of people that we do that with, because if we have 100 people, Mark and I can't spend time with everybody. But if you get your name on that list now, we'll make sure that you can get a spot. All right. That's the that's the announcement about the retreat. Uh, I'll I'll also just say. Uh, it won't just be sitting around with notebooks quite all weekend. Although if you want to pull out spreadsheets and whatever, we'd give you our thoughts. Um, we're also going to have fun together. We know, Mark and I both know, and you do too, if you've ever been away with a weekend with some quality dudes, that just being with great men for the weekend, uh, is there's a benefit of that. And we know that you're going to fall in love with the uh, with our community, other people who are running the same distance same same direction you are. So we're going to make sure that there's plenty of time just to be together and play golf and go hiking and blah, blah, blah. So that's the announcement. Yeah. Looking forward to okay. it. Okay. Okay. So you'll be there. You, you, you haven't turned off by my announcement. No, I'm planning to be there as long as the, uh, the pay is sufficient. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Well, well, we'll make sure you're remunerated richly for your time. Yeah. No. Okay. I, I, I would be there even if I uh, was was not one of the occasional co-hosts of the Abraham's Walt podcast. I would be. I would want to be there myself because I, I'm. Us. You and I are more familiar with our community than uh, anybody else is, and we know the quality of dudes that come sniffing around here, and they're just a great crew. Okay, today's episode, we're going to be talking about how a million dollars doesn't make you rich nor does a $500,000 a year income make you rich. So I just want to say this in introduction. Um, We do concern ourselves here at Abraham's Wallet with the sort of the theology of wealth and the biblical expectation that those with money are expected to maximize that money for their families and for the kingdom of God. So we know that we are in the wealth business And we're also really concerned about how people think about wealth. So a couple of thoughts just on the way that we think about wealth. One, um, if if you hear that number, I I definitely remember when I was making $9,000 a year, I probably wouldn't have tuned into this episode just because of the title. I would have just thought, you people are insane. If you don't think that a million dollars is wealth, uh, Mark's going to make his case in a minute. 
But uh, I just want to say about thinking in general, thinking that I'm poor and that I have nothing and I'll never have anything, that's bad and it's wrong. Uh, you always have something to be grateful for and you always have something to steward, always. God is good and generous to everyone. Read The Hiding Place if you want a good primer on gratitude from someone who lived through a Nazi concentration camp and God spoke to her about being grateful in the midst of it. It's a great read. Number two, thinking that wealth, that is actual unimagined wealth, you actually are stinking rich, and thinking that that uh, is your ticket out of work and responsibility is also anathema. This will kill your soul as we have gone over around here many times. The value of work is not limited to producing income for you. It does much more for you than that. Now, finally, and now we're rolling up to the curb of what we're going to talk about today. Finally, thinking that you are truly wealthy when you are not is a particularly ugly disease because the worst deception is self-deception. For instance, thinking that you're a Christian when you're really not has to be the saddest possible outcome of someone's life. But mis misbelieving that things are good when they're not in whatever the situation is, is a horrible scenario. And we want to help you think all right. So uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what real wealth is like by the numbers, practically what real wealth is, not so that you can start worrying. Oh, I thought I had money, but now I don't. Oh, we, we hate that kind of anxiety, that kind of money grubbing anxiety. That's not our goal. It's not our goal so that you can start comparing yourself with other people. Um, there's, there's enough of that. It's not godly. We're not inter interested in that. And it's not because we don't, we're trying to look down our noses at anybody who's struggling financially. That's not a fun place to be in. And we're not saying, oh, you, you think you're rich? You're not rich, you dork. Uh, that, that's not where we're coming from. I'll, I'll, I'll pause. I'll take a slight breath and let you speak. Well, yeah, I wanted to just chime in before I go on my... I, I'm not going to lie, I have a little bit of a rant to go on today. Before oh, I do that, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, there are lots of people that uh, we talk to all the time that think they're loaded and are therefore acting in a certain way, and it's sh sort of shameful. It's, a, it's toxic to them, and it doesn't lead to good results. However, there are also lots of people who I would consider on the path to multi-generational wealth that don't have a million dollars or don't have a high income. So um, I just don't want anybody to tune out right now because they go, well, good good episode. I'm going to bookmark it. And when I get a million dollars, I'll remind myself that I, I'm not able to just kick back. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about today. And if if you retired with a third of the money we're talking about, there's there's still a path, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tease that out a bit as we go. I promise right. that what we're gonna talk about today is applicable, whether you're high income, whether you have a giant 401k, or whether you're 26 and are at the very beginning of even considering what you might be able to build when it comes to long-term wealth. That's right. That's right. We're gonna be going over some principles that will that we can all learn from, regardless. But it's these attitudes about wealth that are. Uh, flights of fancy. We'd like to prick the bubble of illusion if that exists for anybody. And we'd like to walk us into some more biblical thinking. So Mark, why don't you take it away? Why don't you talk yeah. to us about what what is real wealth and what do the well, numbers actually say? Yeah. And the, the other disclaimer I'll make here is that I've had people ask me from various episodes we've done, hey, were you guys talking about me? Uh, and and it's funny because a lot of people that we talk to about their money one on one as as our day job as financial planners, they think maybe their situation or their their thought patterns around money is super unique. Is unique, right? Um, and I can promise you that everything we're going to talk about today comes from at least tens of families, uh, you know, big bunches of people who we've seen the exact same patterns, even in many cases at the same numbers. Um, so so if that's you by any chance, if you're somebody that maybe has had a conversation with Stephen or I about your money, we're not talking about you. We're talking about repeated patterns of thought and behavior that we see, uh, especially when we work with, with believing families who get their hands on some money. Um, and so right. I, I, 
I just, it's a, it's a story that keeps repeating itself where somebody, they come to us and maybe they just were a really hard worker for a whole career and they retire. They, maybe they retired making $125,000 a year, fine income. Um, but you know, they were on a budget that whole time. That's not enough to just go, ah, I can spend whatever I want. And they retire and they go, you know, I never really paid attention to this retirement account, but it turns out I've got over a million dollars sitting in a, in a 401k. I, I'm a millionaire. I'm rich. <laughs> like you said, that is a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> but there is a, a fallacy that I just hear over and over, which is, you know, I've never even contemplated this much money. And I, I, I kind of feel like it can't be exhausted. Uh, but, but I'm here to burst that bubble a little bit. Um, so I'm going to bring some data to bear. So in the U.S., surveying the whole country right now, on average, a $1 million nest egg, how many years worth of living expense do you think that covers on average across the whole country? Oh, now I'm having to guess what people live on. Um, 40 years? The answer is 18.9 years. Mm. Um, and that can be really affected by where you retire and obviously how you spend. You know, if you're in Hawaii, that drops all the way down to 10 years. And wow. it's more than 20 years in a bunch of states that are lower cost. But um, it's not escape velocity money like a lot of right. us assume. Um you know, yeah, that's a, that gives people a living wage for their lifetime. That 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 does not include include the cruises on the QE two, right? Well, the old school method of doing kind of a safe withdrawal rate was to say you can take four percent of your principal without uh, too much risk to to invading the the principal balance. So if we have a million dollars, the math is straightforward. Four percent means forty thousand dollars a year. That's not in any part of America living super high on the hog. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this this 4% rule was kind of what was popularized by Mr. Money Mustache and the financial independence retire early people. They're like, if I combine that that safe withdrawal rate with extreme frugality, I can save up enough to, to retire early. And the problem with that is it requires extreme frugality. Mm. Um, so if we're talking about $150,000 a year is what you need to be comfortable in retirement and you want to use the 4% rule, well, you now need almost a $4 million 401k account. So, um, that's difficult to save up for most people. That's, that's one case study that I see a lot is, oh, I've got a big pile of money and I feel like now I can change the way I behave and act because I, I have it. Um, the other thing that's that's another side of a similar coin is I make a lot of money. Like I am really high income. Right. And so I feel like I can behave in a way that is totally different than, it, than I would if I made more of an average income. Um, and so the first kind of thing I want to hit is that there are psychological and behavioral effects of high income or high assets uh, that we want you to be aware of and be on your guard for. Would you say that's the more common thing, Mark, is people who uh, get a big paycheck and so they start going crazy when there's actually, they have very little backstop as far as wealth, but they think big paycheck, I'm going to go crazy. This is obviously the story of every pro athlete. What, don't you think that that's, that's more common to, to fool people? Because I don't think of, there's a lot of people with small paychecks with large bank accounts that are going, let's go crazy. What do you think? Yeah, I, I see both, to be honest. Okay. Um, but I, I think for the people listening to this podcast, a lot of them probably, we probably have more people listening right now that are in that high income, no assets or low assets bucket yeah. than in the low income, high assets bucket. Uh -huh. um, and there's unique risks to each category. Okay. Um, so I found that people who maybe they didn't grow up around a lot of money or, you know, they could be the first high earner in their generations or they 
you know, I talked about the, the person who worked for a company for a long time and built up a 401k and maybe it was a publicly traded company and they, they had their company stock in there and that company has grown a lot. So they didn't even necessarily save a ton of money, but they, uh, they now have a big account. Mm-hmm. Um, so upon retirement, maybe that person, they, they look up and they go, holy cow, I've got so much money. I can do all the things now that I never could do when I had a budget that maybe maybe I was diligent and I had a budget that provided me five to ten thousand dollars a year of extra where I had to decide what are we gonna do with that? But I never ever looked up and thought, Well, I have I have a million dollars. Um yeah. and so that's that's the one person. And in the case of the high income person, you know, the trap that I see for them most frequently is thinking. I know that I need to think about the long term, but I'm going to be fine because my income is so high. So okay. I want to put some things in place right now to enjoy life. And um, it's going to be really easy. You know, Mark, you're telling me I need to save 50 grand a year. Well, I make 500,000 a year in my home. And so it's going to be really easy for me to catch up if I decide to take that 50 grand. Right. Well, you save. hear that a lot. Yep. And like, don't tell me not to go on this European vacation and or buy the sports car, whatever, because I can catch up. It's no problem. Yeah. Um, and I would say that people who are, quote, used to high amounts of wealth, whether that's assets or income, they don't make those kind of silly assumptions. Um, it's it's almost more of a poverty mentality when when the income or the assets is high to go. I should spend this. I should use this because I've never been able to do this before. And somebody who's who's comfortable stewarding either high income or uh, large amounts of assets, they go, "No, I know how to handle myself with this these streams of income." And I know that, you know, in our world, it's I know that my job is to steward and multiply it, not to use it to to get while the getting's good, if you will. So let me let me tell you two stories. Uh, they're hypotheticals, but the first one is our 401k millionaire, right? They, uh, they've they never had this kind of money and they wake up and they see a million dollars in the 401k and they go, wow, this is awesome. And they say, well, I'm going to be responsible. You know, I only need $60,000 a year to, to live. That'll pay my bills, no problem. Um, but we've always wanted a, a nice kitchen renovation. And I don't know, Stephen, if you've looked at the cost of renovation lately. No. But it used to be sort of reasonable to think you could redo a kitchen for $40,000. New appliances, cabinets, countertops, all that jazz. The, the the kitchen reno world now, you're spending 150 to even have a conversation with anyone. Oh my gosh. Um so and and, and I see 300,000 all the time in oh kitchen renovation land. So you know, if you've never investigated that and you think I'm being hyperbolic, I'm not. Uh, but this couple says, we'd like to do that kitchen renovation. And then from there on, we don't have any other big goals. $60,000 a year will meet our needs. So they they need, in year one, they need uh, $210,000. 150 for the reno and 60 for their living expenses. Well, this is a 401k, so it's got to be taxed when you take the money out. Um, they're going to have to pull 250000 out of that thing right away just to get the 210 that they need. Right. Um, so that, that comes right off the top. And year two, now I've got 750000 in my 401k. And if we just assume a normal 2.5% inflation rate and I need 5000 bucks a month, uh, my 401k, if I, if I assume it's growing at 6%, which is a pretty, pretty actually... Uh, good growth rate for for somebody who's in retirement um my my 401k is completely empty in 12 years now wow um and so if i had not done the renovation maybe you go well that was dumb you spent a uh, a quarter of your nest egg in year 1 so let's say i had not done the renovation um now i can live for 17 years in that scenario uh, that's not long enough if I retired at 65 wow. to, to fund this type of, uh, of need. Um, so 
if I needed to fund my entire retirement, then 1.5 million would get me to 29 years. But again, that's spending my million dollars down to zero with no other expenses but my annual and no multi-generational assets that I'm passing along. Uh, So most people who are listening to this podcast are probably thinking, that's not really what I'm dreaming of when I talk about being a family team on mission. Of course. Um, So there's some nuance to that. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Like Social Security is a piece of it. How does that factor in? So maybe, maybe it lasts... 24 years instead of 12, that still doesn't get us all the way to what we're trying to build, which is a, a long-term growing concern instead of right. spend it down. Um, right. So that's the million dollar couple. Now let me switch gears and talk about Bob and Sally, my high earners. So they each work at a tech startup in, in California. And well, no, I actually think I put them in Texas um, so that they didn't have to pay, pay any state income tax. Right, and they're they're loving life. They're making two hundred fifty thousand a piece. Um, two kids living in their early thirties, and they're just thinking we can spend a lot because we make a lot. So life is pretty good. Um, and they have heard also that they're supposed to be saving. So they they're thirty two years old, and they're saying we're going to put ten percent of our income into retirement accounts with an employer match. And surely that will be enough. You know, we're going to make a 7% return on that money. And when they get to retirement, if they start right now saving 10% and their employer's dumping another 4% into that account, and they get to retirement at 65 and they're willing to live on half of what they make now, keeping in mind that they, they have become kind of accustomed to living on a very high income. Yes. But, but they think we can do it on half then under this plan, they would run out of money at age 91. Meaning, again, there's zero dollars left. Now, 91, that's not terrible. A lot of people would say that's probably a pretty normal life expectancy. So if we can make it to 91, we've probably made it across the finish line. Um, But that number, uh, if they, let's say that they say, well, we really need 75% of our current income in retirement. Then the the age drops to 80 at which they've gone busto, um, which is dangerous. And this time I'm including everything. I'm including social security benefits, which we know may or may not still be around at the current level by the time this young couple gets to retirement. So this really is a scenario where they're taking some, some pretty huge risk. Um, and it assumes that they have diligently put that money aside every single year and worked both of them all the way up until retirement. Right. What really happens, Steve, in practice is that Bob and Sally don't go from zero savers at age 32 to rock star savers at age 33. That's right. They start saving here and there. They have a good year, but they've learned to treat themselves. So That's they do. it. Their lifestyle. They do the renovation and they go on the European vacation and they say, you know, it's a great idea for us to send little Timmy to a private school. Um, And so some years they hit their savings goals, some years they don't. And at the end of the day, they end up in the same bucket as our friends Antoine Walker and Latrell Sprewell, um, some some favorite NBA players of the 90s who uh, made gobs of money and then ended up with zero to show for it. Yes. Um, and so I would just say that is a common story. And if you're hearing it and you go, well, uh oh, that kind of sounds like me. I would also say any poverty. We've done a whole episode on poverty and what that mindset is and what it looks like. Any poverty in your story is going to exacerbate this a lot. Uh, meaning your your base operating mode is spend it when I get it because I right. might not have it tomorrow. Right. So that's kind of the the psychological effect, I think, of high income or high assets. Yeah. One one of the things I'm hearing you say is it's so easy, one, to become addicted, and I can't think of a better word, addicted to a lifestyle of indulgence uh, is, is super pejorative sounding, but just saying yes to everything and thinking there's a when I turn on the faucet, the water comes out. So I plan on turning on the water all the time. And that you, you become 
accustomed to this lifestyle while you're telling yourself at the same time, I don't need this lifestyle. I could say no to it at any time. Well, are you going to? Have you? What makes you think that that can happen? When you say, you know, the lie that you described, the I'll catch up. We, you know, we, we're making so much money right now. In one year, we could catch up three, four years of, you're, you are fooling yourself because you have ballooned your lifestyle up that it eats up all of that money. And you're not gonna turn, you're not gonna go in reverse on your lifestyle. All right. I don't know if you're gonna say this anywhere in this episode, so I'll just throw it out here. You know what we like? We like an invention called, do you know what I'm gonna say? I think you're gonna say low do fab. Low do fab, where we all use the no muscle. Titus 2 says that the Spirit of God teaches us how to say no when we want something that God is saying, no, that's not good for you. The God's Spirit teaches us how to say no. Most people do not have that muscle that says no. Americans are never encouraged to use that muscle. And this is the, that's the thing that's going to get you in this trouble that Mark is talking about is just having thumbs up, let's go all the time while telling yourself, this is the insidious lie, while telling yourself, we can turn it off at any point, but you have no reason to actually think that you could or would because you don't and you never have. That's the right. other thing that I'm just thinking as you're using those numbers, Mark, is how people um, completely, when they think of the future, they think of how big their 401k is, though it's going to be huge, we've got tons, is as you've already pointed out, they completely disregard um, the function of inflation and that a million dollars today is going to decrease in value over time. And that 10 years from now, a million dollars won't be as big as it was. And 20 years from now, it's going to be sizably smaller just in usefulness as it is today. That's just how it works. But we think a million dollars, that's an unlimited bucket of money. It is not an unlimited bucket of money. Yeah, that's true. The The last thing I wanted to say before I get into some specific instructions for you, yeah. if you're in either of these circumstances, is low income people that I work with can and often do end up having more multi-generational wealth than high income people. Um, oh, now that now you've just said something very sticky and exciting. Repeat that headline because that's very encouraging. Low income families can and do often end up having more multi-generational wealth than high income families. Hopeful. Um, Go on. So I repeatedly see families who are not high income, but they have embedded the truth of First Timothy 6.6 6 into their hearts. And that verse says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Um, those Amen. people, they just tend to pass along more multi-generational wealth than people who have made like a seven-figure income. Uh, but are constantly looking for what is the lifestyle level that I can upgrade to and sustain based on this high income. Because the content person, you know, we've experienced this uh, in, just in personal circumstances where you go, maybe you have a parent that retires and, and they go, well, I'm just content with what I've got coming in. I don't you're telling me I could spend more money, but I don't really want to. I, I'm very happy with what I'm getting. It's my meeting mother. my needs. And those people, they go, yeah, I guess grow my money because it can do things for my future generations and my grandchildren and great-grandchildren could benefit from it. But I'm content. I'm not trying to upgrade the lifestyle. Yes. Whereas I often see people who are high income in retirement, they start going, well, I mean, I guess I could, I could pass some of this along, but I, I'm really realizing it's time to even even expand how much I could enjoy myself right now. Insanity. Um, and it's not the best. It's not what we're uh, <laughs> trying to uh, it's not what we're trying to do point you towards if you want lasting uh, enjoyment, but also uh, reward for the way you've handled money. I don't think the Lord looks at a family who's gotten really good at earning money and has responded with this kind of ever escalating lifestyle thing and goes, there's a good place for me to put some resources. You mentioned this biblical maxim, 
godliness with contentment is great gain. No, and, and obviously we know Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in all circumstances, whether it's with a little or with much. But there's also a financial maxim. This came my way through my German fastidious mother, and it is live below your means. That's pretty, pretty common financial advice. Live below your means. And that doesn't just mean make sure that you don't outspend your paycheck because living is much more than spending. So if you live below your means, that means that your giving is included there, your generous giver. It means that all of your saving and planning for the future is in there and all of the spending that you need to do. And as you always uh, are challenging on, Mark, even your known future spending, like I know I'm going to buy a car five years from now. I'm work. I'm saving up that money right now. I know that we're we might need an upgrade on the very expensive kitchen in ten years. I'm saving up for that right now. All of that is your living, and if you can live below your means, whatever your means are, then you're you're in the black. That you're getting ahead of this whole story. It's not about uh, well. I spend what I want, and at the end of the day, we've got some money left over. That's not that's not a win. We 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 keep seeing that puts people in jeopardy, and it certainly puts future generations in jeopardy. Yeah, Stephen, we were doing some some family Bible reading last night, oh. and we were reading. We've been working our way through Acts, and in chapter twenty six, Paul, you remember the scene where he is on trial before King Agrippa and Festus. Verse 20, um, he makes a little comment about how he's preaching the gospel that that people should repent and turn to God and demonstrate that their repentance is true through their obedience. Um, it just stuck out to me. I was like, man, we don't teach this very often no. that we should expect to see a life that demonstrates obedience. And if we don't, we should go, hmm. Am I am I a Christ follower at all? That's and exactly so, right. Is there salvation here at all? It Where's doesn't change. It doesn't at all uh, stand at odds with the the gospel message that salvation comes exclusively through the work of Christ. Um, and it should give us pause if we look at our own lives and say the way I spend money looks exactly like some pagan who got their hands on money, and this is what they would do with it. So well said, Mark Parrot, and a fair statement. Not a normal one in the modern Christian church, but a fair statement biblically, yes. But I want to give you some takeaways. So if this is you, or maybe you're like, I'm not there, but but there's a good chance if I kind of continue on building my business or growing my career, I could be in a high income spot or I could I could save up a nest egg that was substantial. Um, I have some, some action items for you. Um, you ready for them? Yeah. Give me, okay. some, give me some items. Number one, be very cautious about hanging around people who spend a ton of money regularly. It's true. I'm not saying don't associate with big spenders or cut them out of your lives, but I get to spend a lot of time with high earning families because of my job. And I, I have the unique position that most people don't have of when I'm spending time with these families, I know all about their income and assets. I kind of know all the details. <laughs> yeah. And it, I would say it's so encouraging to me to spend time with a family that is just financially crushing it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they're doing 5X better than me in terms of their assets or their earnings, but they're channeling their wealth into things like productive assets and they live relatively simply, et cetera. Uh, and conversely, if I hang around families who are big spenders and they're throwing money around and lifestyle upgrades and luxury, you know, almost regardless of whether they can, quote, afford it or not. So maybe they're not running themselves into bankruptcy at all. They, they have this money. I leave feeling a little bit dissatisfied in my own stuff. It's true. And it engenders this feeling of, you know, for me. Well, you know, I could afford a car like that. I could right. afford to go eat those types of dinners twice a week if I wanted to, and I wouldn't run out of money. So why am I not doing it? Yeah. Um, so there is an effect 
of spending time with people who throw money around that way that I would say is generally for most people going to be a detriment to your path in developing good stewardship, not a, an aid. Great tip. Good thought. I, I, let me just pile on to that and say that, you know, there's so many funny little gotchas out there in the world that people think, oh, they're really sticking it to the Bible people. One of those gotchas is that when Paul warns about, uh, you didn't think you were going to hear this word in this episode, but when Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 6 about homosexuality, he lumps it into a group of sins that are all egregious in God's sight. One of those sins in that list is greed. And many times when the Christians are out in the world harping on homosexuality, anybody who's a proponent of sexual freedom, if you want to call it that, will say, yeah, well, I don't see anybody preaching on greed. And my reaction is that if they're in the list of sins in the Bible, we're teaching them as sins. Greed is an egregious thing. And I just will warn everybody, don't hang around people who call themselves Christians but are greedy. You can see that they're greedy with their lifestyle. They're always looking out how to serve themselves. Don't hang around them. The Bible says to avoid them. They are going to be poison for your spirit and poison for your checkbook. Word from the wise there, straight out of the Bible. That's right. Which leads me right into our second oh. action item, okay. which is if you hear this and you go at some level, large or small, I'm greedy. Um, praise God, okay? If that's yeah. you and you're hearing this, pull over, stop your run, whatever you're doing. I have good news. When the Holy Spirit puts his Amen. finger on our forehead and identifies a sin, that's his grace. It's not, uh, it's not there to say, well, we've now marked you as a loser for the rest of eternity. It's to say there's an easy, uh, praise be to Jesus Christ, an easy way for us to walk out of that, that thing we, we've identified, and it's called repentance. So, Stephen, what does it look like, do you think, to repent if you, if you have just said, I'm greedy, I have greed, that's a marker yes. of how I deal with, with money and wealth? Thank you for bringing that up, Mark. You know, we don't talk about things like this because it is our joy to castigate and condemn people. It is our joy to castigate and condemn sin because it's evil and we hate it. Now, but if you find those, these things describing you, I, I don't, it's not my pleasure for you to get bent out of shape and angry about it. It's very exciting, as Mark just described, to think that you might have a moment of pause and go, hold on a second. I can see that the lifestyle that I am becoming addicted to and I'm leading my family into becoming addicted to is not in keeping with our actual wealth. I don't, I don't have the right to live this way. I can see that um, long term, I'm going to jeopardize uh, our, our family wealth, our multi-generational wealth. And even as you've been talking through some of these scenarios, Mark, some people have to be thinking, well, by the time I'm 80, maybe my kids can throw a little money my way which is an evil thought, by the way, that's not supposed to happen. You're not supposed to depend on the largesse of the next generations to provide for yourself. It's within reason that you would provide for yourself. So let's say that that has happened to you. There's some sort of convicting going on. And I'm, I, I, I'll go with your example, Mark, that there's a dude on a run and he's on the, he's on the trail and he's hearing this stuff and he goes, that hits me right between the eyes. I would totally uh, second what you said, Mark, which is why don't you stop for a second? Why don't you either find a bench to sit down on or get on your knees in the grass beside the trail and before God, just say this, God, I agree with you about me. This is a, such an important moment in somebody's spiritual development to simply say, I see it your way, God. I want to agree with what you are saying about me right now. I can feel it in my spirit. I feel like a disturbance in my soul because I feel like I'm living in ways that do not lead to life and don't honor you. They're not selfless. They're not Christ-like. I want to stop walking down this road. 
So that's, that is really point number one is that you would just say that to God. I want to agree with what you say. I want to see things your way. And then the second thing would just be to say, God, from this moment forward, you just help me to make steps so that I can, and this is that repentance thing you're talking about, Mark, so that I can amend my ways. How, how can I stop walking down the road I'm walking down right now, which leads to destruction, even if it's just indulgence, even if it's just self-indulgence that never you never turn the water faucet off of indulgence. God, how can I stop this road that we're going down? Would you give me some specific ideas? Um, I'm, I'm sorry to make this a commercial. I'm just trying to think of, of, of resources for you, but it wouldn't hurt my feelings in the least if we had a handful of guys like that that showed up in Kentucky in October that were just going, I don't know how to dial back my lifestyle. I don't know what to do. Can we get some godly help to answer this question? That's the kind of thing that a friend could do with you. You really need to have that moment where you say on a spiritual level, I agree with you, God. I'm sorry for the sin that I've been walking in. And secondly, I need you to spell it out for me what I can do to change my ways. How can I turn, turn my lifestyle down and how can I not walk in greed? Yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you for pulling over before you went through this process. And now I'm going to give you, what, four more possible ideas of ways you might walk out some of that stuff. Great. So my, my third specific takeaway is that debt allows high earners to live like wealthy people and simultaneously ensure that they will never become wealthy people. Um, the, that's a great statement. I'm sorry for doing this. Just say that again. That's a great, that's a great true statement. That's a, that's a tweet right there. Go ahead. Sounds so nice. I'll say it twice. Yeah, I'll say uh, it twice. Debt allows high earners to live like wealthy people and simultaneously ensure that they will never become wealthy people. That's right. Um, so, for example, the, you might have heard the rule about 30% of your income is a good rule of thumb for how much you spend on housing. That's a very useful rule if you make $60,000 a year and you're trying to say, I'm trying to find a place to rent and I don't want to go crazy. It's an absurd rule if you make $500,000 a year, for example. So, you know, car payments, we've talked about this on the podcast. Car payments are a bit out of control right now. And instead of just stepping back and going, uh, I can't afford a new vehicle when you find out that the whatever Honda that you thought was a totally reasonable family car costs that much. People are saying instead, well, I guess this is just the cost of entry for living in society now. So here's my $1,400 a month car payment. I will tell you, reliable transportation remains affordable. Um, there are options out there and I see people all the time. I had a conversation just with a friend, not a client, just somebody who was asking my opinion. And we were going through all the details of this car they wanted to buy. And they had good reasons, big family needed all that. And I said, well, you can't afford it. And they said, well, I'm going to buy it. So if that's true, then what? And I, you know, love this person. I was like, well, here's my thoughts on the least destructive way to make a move that I think is not helpful for you. Um, but at the end of the day, the-, the Now you're I'm a financial going, advisor, is that right, Mark? I am a financial advisor. So you so you, you advise people with regards to their finances? I do. They, they pay you to advise them with regard to their finances? Yes, although not in this case. This was just a buddy. Okay. And, and then they, and then many times in spite of your professional status as a certified financial planner and your, and your years of experience in this, people will, you're telling me that they will just shrug their shoulders and say, I don't care what you say, I'm doing it anyways. I think that happens whether I'm working in a professional sense or just uh, throwing my arm around a friend who's picking my brain. Yeah. I think that's called okay. living with humans. They don't always right, take just, your advice. Just, yeah, okay. Just and checking. that's fine. People don't have to take our advice. But I want to tell you that whether it's housing or vehicles or any of these things that have gone up in price, groceries, I mean, whatever. The idea that, well, there's just a baseline that I deserve 
or that I uh, that I should be be totally comfortable expecting. That's a dangerous spot, and debt specifically in a lot of those areas allows people to make choices that are very bad for them because again a high earner the the ratios are what the lenders are using to decide if you can have a loan um the pure numbers you know you can go get a loan that's a $125,000 for a big SUV right now that that can be done and yeah. you might qualify for it, and it could still be an absolutely disastrous decision for you. Next point, aggressively hunt down, this kind of ties in, but aggressively hunt down any sense of entitlement that you might feel due to being at a certain age or income level or job title or life event. Um, and I see some, I see this all the time. Somebody's like, I sold a business, maybe I sold it for $2 million. And I think I've arrived, so I deserve this. Now, we have advised in the past, when the Lord blesses your family with a specific financial blessing, it's good and right to celebrate and even like give thanks and throw a party, whatever. Um, yes. Mark it with something that you wouldn't normally do. I think a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago, you talked about the crazy amount of money you spent on a stake in New York City when you guys got a huge financial windfall. It's true. Um, however, I, I, I see this go badly when people start saying, well, I'm a VP at fill in the blank big company. So this is kind of what I deserve now. I yep. should be you know, driving this or I deserve to live in this neighborhood. With um, the other VPs. This is where everyone else lives. Of course, um, you know, I'm, I've, I've lived frugally for the last 20 years. I'm 45 now, and it's about time that, that I started flying first class. I've heard that before. Um, yeah, dangerous. You're on, you're on thin ice there. And so yeah. look for that stuff. We, I'll, I'll say it, we all have it. Um, yeah. It's in us somewhere where we go, you know, uh, I, I think I deserve this. and just mark it and be aware of it and um you know repent turn away as needed um or just be aware of it it doesn't mean you know steven i wouldn't say like if that feeling came up in you it means it would be a sin and wrong for you to live in the nice neighborhood i'm not saying that I'm right saying be aware that that component is there and as a part of the mix when you're trying to make decisions and go that's not what should guide me good stewardship and faithfulness is what I'm after. And I just have to be aware that there's some parts of me that might pull me in the direction of greed and entitlement. That's right. That's great. I've got two more. One is we can't rely upon money or assets at all. So (laughs) the point of this, I I was a little worried when we did did this title. I was like, I don't want to tell people a million dollars isn't that much. So you should have $3 million. (laughs) But um, Tim Millen sure is. Right. Um, but I do think it's wise to still do your best to, quote, kind of lock in future provision before you start upgrading your lifestyle. Um, you know, we've talked to in the past, there's a blog that, that has been really influential to me called The White Coat Investor. And he writes financial advice for physicians because they tend to go like from low income to super high income very fast. And he talks all the time about if you will just live like a resident until you get your debt paid off and build a nest egg, it'll have a huge positive effect on your life. Um, And and I think that's true for everybody that, you know, if before you just think, well, my income's up so I can upgrade the lifestyle. And we've already talked about the fact that those upgrades, whether or not you believe it, are generally permanent. Um, That's right. I'm not sure that I'll ever have another vehicle, Stephen, with cloth seats. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I it's, just it's real. It's true. I, I never had one that had leather seats until the last car, the last used car I bought, and now I'm kind of like, I don't know that I can go. Uh, uh, Lord willing, I can certainly go back if the yeah, need you arises. could, you could. But I've kind of become accustomed to that luxury, of course. Um, and so I would just say. You know, if you can, instead of as income and assets rise, think, 
well, what are the corresponding changes to the budget? And I'm just going to elevate everything. If my income went up 20%, everything goes up 20%. I could actually use that to secure as much as we can some future provision, like the, the grocery bills are paid in retirement. That can be a really positive thing just in terms of learning how to be a good steward. And that leads to my final point, which is that if you do this, like if you're able to kind of lock in the basic provision, then you start to get to dream bigger and you're, you're going to be at a crossroads. You can either dream bigger about your stupid wants and lusts when it comes to stuff you'd like to buy. True. Um, or you can have dreams that actually line up with the biblical picture of what it looks like to steward wealth. Ah. Um, so I talked about this, and I am not trying to toot my own horn. You can edit this out if you think it is. But okay. he saved pretty aggressively for college um, for uh, quite a few years. And we, we could have hit our target early like we did recently where we went, hmm, I think if we don't put any more money into this fund, it's enough to pay for education expenses uh, for our kids. And we could have said, sweet, now we've got an extra thousand bucks a month. Well, let's go buy a cool hot tub or a car or something. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, what was really, really more fun and impactful in the long run was we started talking about how could we now take that same amount of money and start pushing it out the next generation and yes. the next generation. And I went just, I applied a little of the uh, financial planning science and I went, well, if we just keep doing what we've been doing in for another 10 or 20 years, we could potentially have the great grandkids educations funded. Um, and I'm not saying that's the right answer for everybody. Some people are like, well, education's not it for us, but whatever you do. But it's the right way to think. I think that if you're talking about multi-generational wealth and legacy with your mouth, but you only do things with your money that you'll get to enjoy and experience in your lifetime, then you're a fake. Sirens off. I heard that. That's good. So we all do this to some degree. And I think, you know, we'll probably bat this around in our volley channel with our Abraham's Wallet insiders. But we all have areas where we need brothers to look look over our shoulder and go, well, you keep talking about multi-generational wealth, but uh, you told me you got a 10% raise. And when I do the math, like your lifestyle went up a lot. Um, one of the resources that we're working on right now to help you not be a faker when it comes to this idea of multi-generational wealth stewardship and wealth building um, is, Steve, you've been working on a guide for groups of guys to get together and share some financial uh, transparency, accountability, and even give them a framework in which they can can call each other out on some of this stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm I'm very excited about this. We're we're rounding third and headed towards home on this guide. We've already had some test uh, trials of this guide. We're doing some final edits, then it's gonna be handed over to the designer. People might've heard us mention this before, but the idea is let's say you've got a small group of five to 10 guys that get together around a, a fire pit once a week or once a month, and they just talk about problems. They just talk about their lives and just they just wanna be known by some men. They just wanna have some real friends that talk about real things. So be on the lookout, that guide is coming. These are the kind of relationships I want you to be able to have. Yeah, that's my encouragement to the crew. If you're hearing this, we're not here to make you afraid of not having enough. You might have $50,000 left over at the end of your life. And you put that into kind of future generations and establish a kingdom vision for a family. And that is multi-generational wealth, more so than the person who just bathed themselves in their wants and luxuries. It's true. And etc. And they might have even ended up with extra money. They didn't blow it. They didn't uh, run out despite their best efforts, but they left no legacy in terms of a vision or how to steward money. And I contend the Lord looks at the faithful steward that ended up growing a little bit and thinks that's a family that I'm going to use in my kingdom in a way that he just 
he can't trust this other who has never thought hard about why they might be getting wealth and what it's really for. So that's my encouragement. Um, And, you know, if you do happen to have a million dollars and you're wondering, should I spend the 250 on the kitchen reno in the first year of retirement? It's also a good takeaway, just that the answer is probably not. No. Great. I've been thinking, it sounds like a proverb. It's actually from a prophet in the Old Testament. It's Zechariah 4.10. Who despises the day of small beginnings? And this is true financially as well. Wherever you are, you could be like me. And you made $9,000 last year. And you think, how dare you poo-poo on a million dollars, which we're not trying to do. We're just trying to give people realistic experience of the numbers. But whatever your situation, I hope you can see that these principles apply to you. We bless you all to live lives that are not about greed and indulgence, but are realistic. That doesn't mean there's not celebration. It doesn't mean there's not wonderful touches through your life and you get to enjoy all the great things. Paul said this to Timothy, enjoy everything that's from God. That's part of the good life is to enjoy everything that God has. But wherever you are on the financial spectrum, Do not despise the day of small beginnings. Be faithful where you are. And we believe the Bible teaches it will grow into multi-generational wealth. So bless you as you run your home and your dough like a biblical boss.